going on, party people? It's me, Rich. I'm back again with another episode of PTC 2.0. I know it's been a couple of weeks, so hold your horses. We're back this week with Eisner-nominated writer Philip Kennedy Johnson. We have a fun conversation. Check it out. Hey, guys. Welcome to the show. Philip Kennedy Johnson. Philip, how are you? I'm great, man. How are you? I'm pretty good, man. I'm pretty good. You're a busy guy. Um, I I want to talk to you about all the comics you're writing, uh, but first I want to share a quick little story for everybody watching. You did something that nobody has ever done at a Comic-Con. Um, and I've been going to conventions since I was a kid, right? Uh, you write the new Alien book for Marvel. I went up to you. I said, hey, you know, I'd love a signed copy. You turn around and you said, hey, by the way, this is a variant cover. It costs $20. Is that okay with you? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. You personalize it to me, put it in my pocket, had a quick conversation. And then I went along my merry way. Nobody's ever done that. And I got to say, I really appreciate you doing that because that's, that's very kind and very classy. Oh, well, thanks, man. Yeah, I um, I mean, I, yeah, I just don't want to give somebody a book and they think it's a cover price because normally I, I just, I prefer to sell every cover price when I've got it. And that's yeah, yeah. that's all I had left was the $20 one. And I just didn't want to stick somebody with a book they didn't want, you know? Yeah, got it right here. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. Well, yeah, like super cool, man. Like that was like a real, real class act. Usually it's like the handlers just like slapping the money out of your hand and throwing it in a bin or something you know what i mean right, right. boom in your face 20 bucks yeah, yeah exactly you know but no like i really appreciate it. that was really cool um how was the rest of the, the con for you it was great man yeah it's i uh i have not done a lot of conventions this mm. last year obviously but i uh but I, I did awesome con baltimore and um and new york and they were all very positive. They were all very, I mean, honestly, they weren't as crowded as they used to be for obvious reasons. I mean, I, I wish yeah. the reasons were more, you know, positive, but, but the experience of the convention itself was actually really great. Um, at New York Comic Con, the, um, the artist alley is usually just, just this slow moving wave of people that you're just trapped in. And it's, yeah. you're just so trapped down there. And it's still awesome because there's great people there. And I mean, it's it's great for a lot of reasons, but this year there was more room to move around and it wasn't quite so packed in. And it was it was great. And I had a lot of awesome conversations with fans like yourself. And Baltimore was super cool too. It's been a it's been a really good con season for me this past couple of months. That's awesome. Do you do you like I do you actually like the process of of packing all your stuff, getting out there and meeting everybody? Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, packing it all up and everything. I um I, I haven't actually done a whole lot of conventions even before everything got wrong. Like I, I kind of reached a new level of prominence in the industry mm -hmm. um, right when COVID was starting to hit us. Um, right. So I, uh, when I was tabling before I would typically, I would, I would table with boom studios. I would go and kind of help them with their stuff. Cause I had several books out with boom. Mm -hmm. I would sell my work and also kind of help other people with their stuff at the, at the boom booth. Um, and now that I have enough stuff other places that it makes sense to go on my own, I'm still kind of kind of new at it, um, and I have more work than, uh, to take than I used to. So it's uh, a little bit of a chore to drag everything around, but it's still it's well worth it. I mean, it's, you know, talking to the fans is always great, and um, you know, seeing friends in the industry I haven't talked to in a long time, it's a great experience. That's awesome, man. How long have you been uh, doing comics? Um, my first printed book came out in November 2015. That was okay. Last Sons of America at Bed Boom. And then right after that, um, we did Warlords of Appalachia. And that came out mm. just about a year later. Um, and around that same time, I was working on my first licensed work with them. I did um, an Adventure Time short that actually got an Eisner nom, which was cool. Okay. Um, and then I did a Kong book and Warlords, excuse me, um, Power of the Dark Crystal, mm -hmm. the Dark Crystal sequel. Um, so yeah, like I, I, my, my work at boom grew quickly, but it was mostly just there. And then one of those books got noticed by DC, another one that got noticed by Marvel and then everything kind of, kind of went in other directions after that. That's awesome. It's cool how like stuff kind of snowballs like that, like almost out of nowhere where it's like, you know, like I've, I talked to so many people in the industry and it's like, nobody has a direct answer of like, why, you know, it's like, I've done, I do X, Y, and Z. And then all of a sudden Marvel and DC are like, Hey, can you do stuff for us now? Yeah. It's tricky because they, they don't. They like if, if you want to do a DC or Marvel book, you don't solicit them really. They they kind of they want to come to you, and um, so yeah, if that's this is kind of how it works. If you you have to pitch companies to get to get started, mm -hmm. 
but you're not pitching DC for your, for their Batman story right off the bat. Like you have to, you have to get there. And so first you're, you're pitching um, the independent publishers. Um, with, for me, that was boom. I, I pitched boom for a thing I wanted to do there and that worked out. And, um, but of course, by the time one made it across the plate, I'd already pitched, you know, a ton of other shit there and elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it's hard. It's really hard to bust in. And once you do bust in, um, if you prove that you're that you're good to work with, that you're you know not a jerk, that you can turn in your stuff on time, that you're a good collaborator and all that, and the the book you know itself is solid, then other places will start start knocking. Yeah, that's fascinating. I think in the in the industry now, like from a fan's perspective, it's it's cool seeing who's on what book because everybody and yourself included is it's like there's a workhorse attitude like you have a ton of books coming out every month like guys like donny cates and tinian um uh, jeff lemire just putting like solid solid stuff out for a variety of companies um did you grow up a fan of comics oh my god yeah, yeah. i mean i mm-hmm. yeah i learned how to read off of comics straight up i um yeah. my dad brought home I didn't have a, the kind of place where I didn't have the kind of home where you played a lot. I didn't have, I didn't have a lot of playmates, but I, mm-hmm. um, but, but I had a lot of books and dad would bring home all these, these little ripped up comics from, from various places and like mm-hmm. from flea markets or garage sales. And um, yeah, I just loved them. I had, a, I had all these, I mean, they're all kind of, they're all kind of beat up and I ran and read them until they fell apart. Some of them, yeah. but I had all these little Spider-Man team up books. I had a lot of world's finest and brave and the bold um you know batman superman team ups as well and you know individual stuff with each of them Mm -hmm. Uh, a little bit of legion um a little bit of justice league but yeah it was a lot i mean probably more dc than the other stuff and i just really fell in love with those characters especially batman and superman i think early on those are characters that connected with me i I connected with them just so so strongly oh for sure and that was um was that like like mid 80s batman superman Honestly, a lot of the books I was reading back then were were old, even by the time I got them. Oh wow! Okay. Um, so there's a lot of Silver Age stuff. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, and there was some stuff like some Bronze Age too. Um, let's see. But then at some point, I was able to start. I did start buying things off the spinner racks at the grocery stores and stuff back when mm-hmm. you could get them at you know just pretty much anywhere, gas stations or or a, or a garage or a uh, grocery store so i was yeah. so then i was getting stuff like let's see around that time batman would have been like norm bray fogel maybe okay or, um, or before that jim aparo too i have some jim aparo um batman that, back when he was the regular guy yeah like when the outsiders were still a relatively new thing oh yeah yeah that stuff that was like my bread and butter when i was a kid because i kind mm-hmm. of inherited my brother my brother's 12 years my senior so when i was growing up i inherited like a lot of his stuff and then that's about the time when i was starting to get like the 75 cent batman issues done by norm bray fogel do like all that stuff is like very familiar you know like the man of steel stuff the john Byrne, uh dc yeah. stuff which was like a lot of it is like the thing i love about comics is like you kind of go in waves of like just these golden waves of creativity, you know, and that there's like a nice pocket in that, that era. That's like, that's holds up in a very interesting way. Yeah, totally. No, I, I have a lot of affection for those books. And later on, I, I still have all those old comics. They're boxed yeah. up in this room and other rooms. Um, and, but I also buy up the hardcover collections of those when I see them. Like I found the, I saw the, uh, uh, the Batman and the outsiders collections come out and I just, yeah. I didn't hesitate, dude. I, I was so into that because yeah, I didn't yeah. have, I mean, I had some of those, but I didn't have complete runs or anything. It was just whatever was in those old, you know, piles of stuff that dad was finding for, you know, quarter piece or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Those, that book is is pretty fantastic. Uh, I was, I was trying to explain it to my wife about how weird all the characters were. And then it was like, you know, it's like that. I think for me, it was like that first time you see Batman in that different light where he's not with the Justice League, but he's got his own kind of band of like misfits. And I remember being like really, really into Metamorpho. <laughs> yeah, totally. Metamorpho was red. I um, yeah, yeah the, the characters were super interesting and a lot, most of them had powers. So you got like these crazy powers like Geoforce and Metamorpho. Yeah. And, um, Katana was super cool. Um, that There was that weird shit with Alfred where he became the 
What was the name of the character? Did he just become the outsider? Is that the name of his character? I think so. Yeah, he they they threw him in to like a bunch of stuff like towards I want to say like the middle of the run, right? Yeah, there was some something happened and he got he became this other like villain. <laughs> And then so they, they had to like save Alfred from himself. It was yeah. crazy, super out. Yeah. But yeah, just that, I like the idea of Batman as kind of the, 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 the leader of his own, his own little, you know, F you Justice League. Right. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, it's super endearing. Do you still, do you still collect now or is it like, are you so busy that you're just like, you know what, let me just write these books and then do whatever, whatever. Honestly, else I have it was to do. never, it was never so much about collecting for me. It was always mm-hmm. just about reading them. I, I just wanted mm-hmm. the stories. I, um, I was never incredibly precious about, of course, I mean, I'd never been in a comic shop. I mean, I had seriously never been in a comic store to speak of until like, until after my master's degree or something. Well, no, I guess in my undergrad, I found one comic shop and I stepped uh-huh. inside. It was like, oh, wow, there's nothing but comics in here. This is awesome. Because before yeah. that, it was, I'd only ever bought stuff either, you know, at places where people were selling their trash yeah. or, um, or, you know, grocery stores and stuff. I'd never been in a store where they're, they just sold comic books. It was just this amazing thing. I just, I was out in the sticks and that wasn't really a thing where I was. So the, the whole collector's culture of uh, boarding and bagging books and having them graded and everything, that was just not, you know, on my radar until yeah. way later. I was just getting them just to read them. They're all made mm-hmm. out of newsprint. And that, I mean, I don't think I ever had a comic that wasn't a little, at least a little bit beat up, yeah. um, if not just completely wrecked. Well, some of them were those, uh, I forget the name of the, the name of the uh the condition but some i guess the top the top copy of a box of comics they would just like they would just take a box cutter and just like rip off like like cut off half the cover or something yeah 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 like, like mark the others i had a, i had a bunch of those i had yeah. comics that were just like just missing half the cover as long as you got the whole story that where did you grow up by the way iowa okay so you were like I, we drove through Iowa not too re- not too long ago, and it was like for me because I grew up in New York. I'm like, this is amazing. Nothing. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, there. I hadn't Great. I hadn't been there much since I left. Yeah. I, I was there as a kid, and then Kentucky after that, and then went to went to school in Texas for a while. All the all the red state hits. Okay, <laughs> so um, you're you're a writer, you're a musician, and you're a soldier, right? Am I wrong yeah. in making that statement? So no. how do how do you combine the three? when there's so many questions and i know i know you're you're probably very busy but if we can just get through a couple of them like when did you no, decide to. to when did you decide to join the army did the music have something to do with it and like give me like the trifecta of uh writer musician soldier well my whole life i've been very curious well i've always was loved making things mm-hmm. and um that's kind of been my driving my driving passion always mm-hmm. i just want to make things and i don't mean things that uh like I'd build houses if I could, but it was always <laughs> mostly mostly things like, um, you know, telling stories and mm-hmm. playing piano and playing trumpet and you know composing music and uh, drawing. I was a, like, mm-hmm. I was probably if I had to pick one passion, I guess when I was a little kid, it would have been art. I really mm-hmm. loved to draw. Um, but I was also kind of out in the middle of nowhere all the time, so I didn't like things mm-hmm. like classes for for stuff like that or even just like educate myself in any meaningful way. It wasn't really happening. I was just a guy that just loved doing this stuff. Um, so or in high school, I kind of, I was very curious about the military mm-hmm. and I was kind of checking it out, but I, I was pretty ignorant about it. And I didn't know if I, I just assumed that once I, once I became a soldier, I would just be like a capital S soldier, like a war fighter. And that's just, that's what soldiers were. Yeah. Yeah not understanding that there's actually many different kinds of careers you can follow in the military. Yeah. Um, I didn't know any of that. I thought I was like, okay, I'm going to become a soldier and just, you know, go to war and that's the gig. And, um, and then later when I discovered, I ended up going to, to college for, for music. I mm-hmm. became a trumpet player I, in high school. I, I, it became clear that I was like, okay, I'm actually pretty good at this. And this is kind of my tip, my best ticket out of here. Uh, uh-huh. Um, so I'm going to put art aside for a while. I was still drawing just kind of for fun. I was, I was pretty good for a kid. I was good. Um, but I wasn't like, you know, any, anything that would uh, turn heads professionally, but I was, I was good. And, um, I was very unschooled and I mean, in music too, I hadn't really taken lessons or anything, but I just Mm -hmm. practiced my ass off. So I was like, yeah, I'll just do this. And I managed to get a scholarship for, for music in college. That's awesome. Kind of left art behind. And I, be, I became aware of the military bands mm-hmm. uh, and that they, I mean, they have those bands all over the place. Any, any place there's a, a decent sized um, military 
component, there's um, there's a band there too. Yeah. To, to play for ceremonies and things, but also for for morale and whatever else. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, I mean, there's a centuries old um, relationship between you know music and 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 soldiering. Yeah. Um, but I was really taken with the the Washington D.C. bands and mm-hmm. the Academy bands as well. I was like, damn, that seems like a really cool job. Um, the musicians are incredible. The yeah. the benefits are great. You have a, I mean, you got a, a job where you're playing music, but not just because it's fun, because like for higher purpose, you're playing for things that matter and mm-hmm. with other really great musicians, it, it gives you kind of a home base in a in a city where you can play other work as well. It just made a lot of sense to me, but I also wanted to do it all as a musician. I didn't want to just do that. So instead of auditioning right away, I ended up, I just wanted to do other kinds of things uh, mm-hmm. musically. So I, um, you know, I played in a blues band that was really good. I played in some jazz stuff. I, I did, uh, I played in the Glenn Miller band for, for about a year and a half. That's cool. Um, toured with them, toured the world. Um, and then eventually it's like, yeah, let's do this. So I started auditioning for those bands and got, got into the army field band in Washington, DC, which is mm-hmm. where I am now. Um, so that whole time, I'm not really reading for fun anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I kind of set comics aside. I still liked them in theory, but I hadn't gone into a comic store in forever. And mm-hmm. I mean, I'd hardly been in them before that, but I just loved the books that I had and, um, loved just nerd stuff. Um, but then yeah. my younger brother, who's also a musician, a trumpet player and mm-hmm. uh, an artist decided he wanted to go the other way. He wanted to become a, an artist and didn't really know how to get started. He was just, mm-hmm. a, just a kid living in the country, didn't know what to do to get to, but, to break into the industry. And I didn't know either. Um, so I was like, dude, just come move in with me and we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll start going to conventions. We'll find some good shops. We'll read, you know, how to books. We'll do whatever. We'll get yeah. to know comics for dummies. We'll, we'll figure it out together. <laughs> and uh, we totally did that. We just started going to conventions and doing everything we talked about. He, um, he discovered that there's a job in the army called multimedia illustrator uh-huh. where you can enlist and just be an artist for the army. They can, they'll wow. train you up and they'll train you up in illustrator and Photoshop and InDesign and um, teach you how to, how to make these, all these kinds of, mat- all kinds of materials for the army, whether it be um, educational stuff mm-hmm. or, you know, advertising or, you know, more like art, art pieces or, you know, mm-hmm. logos, whatever, like, like whatever, whatever they need. Um, he was doing all that for about six years. And while he was doing that, I was kind of, I was still going to conventions and that I'd already kind of gotten my foot back in the door. Thanks mm-hmm. to him. I was, you know, I'd kind of gotten, gotten my feet back into comics again and um, found that I really loved it and not just reading them. I, I was, I was so taken with how far um, the art form had come since I, since I'd gotten out of it. But I also just really love the collaborative nature of making them. I, I love how mm-hmm. they're how they're put together, and it's it seemed very familiar to me as a as a guy who played a lot of jazz, a lot of small group jazz, mm-hmm. um, just a group of small professionals who all um, shape the the product between them. Just made a lot of sense to me. Um, so I kept going to conventions and met a lot of artists, and eventually put together some some pitch packets, and one of those became Last Sons of America. So, what, so now I'm in this weird place where I still have that. I still have my music career. I'm still playing with the army. Yeah. Um, but I'm also making comics and um, writing for DC and Marvel. So I'm going to right now, the plan is to get to 20 years and then see where we're at. I've been in the army 16 years now. Wow. Uh, so I'm going to put in my 20 and then see where things are, but potentially, yeah. potentially do my 20 and get out and just write after that. But we'll see. That's awesome. So around what year was it? You had mentioned, you hadn't read for a while and then you picked up some stuff and you were blown away by like what elite comics took like around what year did that happen? Oh man. Um, I can tell you what was on the shelves when I went back. So when I, when I left, okay. So in high school I was reading, I did start, I was, I was uh, picking up more and more new stuff by then Mm -hmm. off the spinner rack. I, I, um, after Superman had died and come back is when Mm -hmm. I was, I started picking up stuff off the shelves. So I bought the death of Superman, um, like the, the paperback, I think. Yeah. And then I was buying the return of Superman every, anytime a, a new one come out, came out. So I was, I was reading comics through like the beginning of the long hair Superman era. Yeah. yeah. Um, after he was back 
and I was reading Nightfall and Night's End and all that and Batman. Yeah. And I, I subscribed to Batman for a while um, after Bruce Wayne came back. I was reading Age of Apocalypse, like all the Joe Mad X-Men stuff. Yeah. Um, and then I got out. And when I got back in, um, let's see. I remember seeing the boys on the shelf. All right on. And all these all these superhero deconstructions, like the boys. Yeah. Watchmen, which I never, of course, that's been around forever, but I never read it. Mm-hmm. Um, Irredeemable was coming out new. Um, okay. I think I think the first trade of Irredeemable might have been out then when I was when I was looking around. Lock and Key was coming out. I think okay. um, American Vampire was like brand new. Mm-hmm. Um, Joss Whedon, John Cassidy's um, Astonishing X Men. Oh, for sure. So yeah, I just it was really the contrast from the stuff that I remember to the stuff that was coming out new. I was like, damn, dude, this is so different. And I was oh, yeah. just so impressed by the art I was seeing. Um, so yeah, that's it's uh, it was quite a change. And I was just so taken with it. So um, so you're a full-time army musician. Mm-hmm. So that's like every day you're somewhere, yeah, honing your craft basically with your trumpet. Yeah, I mean, I practice at home, and then we have rehearsals as well. I had rehearsals today, which I apologize. We got a little start, late start today. Don't <laughs> we worry. Are, about it. Don't worry about later it. Later I appreciate it, but don't worry about it. I'm I'm the easiest person on the planet. <laughs> uh, so now, you, I I read on your website that you you're you have a fondness for jazz, right? I do. Yeah. Does any of that? musicality play a part in how you write and how you want your characters and stories to come across because I, I i love i love the juxtaposition of writing with music depending on mood is that an influence for you yeah definitely i am so the, okay the influence of music is is twofold for one i i'm a huge fan of of tolkien's work okay and um tolkien had this had this habit of putting at least in his middle earth stuff he would put a lot of um songs and poems yes. in the body in the in the in the prose and i just thought that was so cool i i was so impressed with it not just in the, in the craft it would take to do that but also mm-hmm. i love the um the conciseness of the world building that you can put into those songs like you can there's so much you can there's so much you can communicate in the body of a song like yeah. if you if you want to actually instead of just explaining like through exposition what the world is like um the history of things how the different races interact or whatever you can just yeah. you can write a song and communicate a lot of that stuff um in a very elegant way so i i always love that and whenever i have opportunities to do that in ways that don't feel shoehorned in i, I do that in my own work now so that's one way in which music is is uh my love of music comes through um, as far as my love of jazz, specifically yeah. small group jazz, so people sometimes hear big band and, and call that jazz. It's kind of a jazz style, but it's not what I like. When I think of jazz, I think of like a small group, like a uh-huh. like a jazz quintet or something. When you've got, you know, typically piano based drums and then a horn or two or guitar or something, some other kind of a solo instrument. Um, and that's the stuff that I really love performing probably if i had to choose one style to do which would be an impossible decision but if i had to pick one i, I really love small group jazz um now in a if, if everyone's really doing their job if you replace any one person in a jazz combo the, the product completely changes right and, um, that's what i found in comics as well even if you just change the colors or you just change the inker or you just change yeah. the letter or even like everyone has a everyone plays a very important role especially if you if you write with those people in mind um, if you're writing nice. something for them to their strengths um, or making sure you're giving everyone something to do and not just some throwaway role, mm-hmm. um, everyone can really make a mark on that book. Um, so when I'm writing, I try to keep everyone else in mind. I try to basically not not just do your own job as well as you can, but also my like part of your job, part of doing, doing your job well is setting up everyone else for success as well. So if you're writing for someone who who wants a lot of direction wants a lot of photo reference or art reference or whatever yeah you should accommodate that in the script if you got somebody else who prefers as little direction as possible you should keep that in mind if you're mm-hmm. writing for someone who is not a native english speaker or if you're writing for someone who you know they really like they do their best work when they're drawing animals or okay 
you know, cars and structures or, you know, really dynamic movement, like a lot of speed lines and kind of a James Heron, very dynamic kind of style. Mm -hmm. You should have that in mind. Um, just, you know, write with your, with your artist in mind, you know, and same thing for the inkers, colorists, letters, everyone else, like know what they're good at and, and what they want to see. So that, uh, like knowing, knowing the, um, the craft of jazz, like I do, I try to approach writing that way as well. Cause it's, you know, at uh, least in a collaborative medium. Did you, uh, I, I'm going to, uh, this is like a two part for you. I'm going to go back a little bit and you mentioned uh, Tolkien's work, uh -huh. right? Clearly you're a Lord of the Rings Hobbit fan. I am. What was your reaction hearing the Misty Mountain song for the first time? Oh my God. Well, okay. I, I know that's not <laughs> the way that Tolkien envisioned that song, but I actually prefer the Howard Shore. It's really beautiful. I loved it. Right. Like I remember seeing that for the, because when you read it, when you it's yes, it's not what is in the Hobbit, but when you read it and then you, when I heard that for the first time, I remember as soon as it came out on like you know, Blu-ray or whatever, I just kept rewinding it. You know? uh, yeah. It Dude, me too. You, I, like... Yeah. When I, when I heard the score, I was like, bye. And I just listened to it a lot. In fact, I actually <laughs> arranged it. I arranged that song for my brass quintet to play. Oh, get out of here. That's cool. Yeah. I, I play in a brass quintet as part of my job with the army field band. The, the quintet's called the federal brass. Uh -huh. And, um, and they're super capable. I, we try to kind of push each other and write a lot of stuff. That's not yeah. typically heard in brass quintet. And often that's like jazz stuff, but sometimes, yeah. sometimes it's um, like film score music or, or game music. I actually did an arrangement of, I did like a theme and variation version of Tetris um, oh, wow. for, for us to play. This meant to, to express um, <laughs> like a, a kid playing Tetris and like f feeling and hearing the, the panic level rising as they, as the blocks get higher and higher. Oh, that's cool. Um, it's really fun. I mean, you can, I got away with it because it's, it's public domain because it's based on that old Russian folk tune. Right. So, right. You know, so you can, there's no, there's no copyright issue. Um, but I also arranged Misty Mountains for Quintet and uh, turned out really cool. It was, it was fun. Did you have a singer for it or did you all kind of like do like no, the humming? Those, just brass. And actually it, it became kind of a, I kind of, I want to say the back half actually kind of became the, the Shire tune. Oh, cool. Uh, it was more, more like a, not exactly a medley, but, um, but yeah, anyway, it was, there was, there were no lyrics in that one, but yeah. uh but no, it turned out nice because there's a, usually a, quint, a brass quintet will have a, a tuba on the bass voice uh -huh. and then trombone. It usually goes tuba, trombone, horn, and then two trumpets. But this particular group, we use bass trombone for the for the tuba voice. So they have two trombones and it's more of a directional kind of yeah. um, in your face kind of sound. And it, it really suited the, 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 the low voice sound. That's um, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Also, that Shire tune, that's my uh, alarm every morning. <laughs> oh, oh my god to wake up to that, that sounds really kind of pleasing and charming I, I might have to do that it it really is honestly like because you know like it's not only for me it's not just my alarm it's also what my wife is gonna hear so instead of like very abrasive like thrash metal it's the happy medium and you wake up with like a nice little bit of Dude, like all right you know no shit i'm gonna change it to that like today <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. a great idea awesome. Awesome. i have awesome. my, my usual my usual alarm that i use for everything else uh -huh. is this recording that i made of my son when he was super little he's probably like right around one year old mm -hmm. we took took a couple of he was walking around the house looking for me he went daddy <laughs> and then later he's like daddy and i took those two and i made it into like in a ringtone oh that's awesome and it's fucking adorable but it's also like it's it's like it is a kind of a slap in the face when you first hear it because it's kind of loud you uh, wake up like so. alarmed <laughs> yeah no i i love it but it makes me feel good but maybe for an alarm the shower would be better that's awesome uh okay so let's, we're gonna go i go a little back and forth with you so like let's go back to you mentioning you talk you're working with artists you kind of almost got to cater to their style who are some of your favorite collaborators because like you've worked with a ton of great great artists so far you know i have man i am um, okay i'm gonna give you some names but i, I do sure. feel a little bad about it because i don't want to like I've, I've been unbelievably blessed with super capable mm -hmm. and talented people i mean i could give you 30 names and and they'd all be just as true i am um, just off the top of my head people i really love working with um 
I've got to say Ricardo Federici. That cool. guy is a maniac. He's so good. Um, he's like a like a Dutch master that just went forward in time and just started making comic books. It's just unbelievably good what he can do. Yeah. Um, he did The Last God with me. And now he is about to do, he's about to be, uh, starting in January, he's going to be my ongoing action comics artist as well. Oh, right on. Uh, and we're all, we're doing all the stuff on War World and God, it could not fit him any better than it does. I mean, it's, he's just made for that Conan, Robert E. Howard type stuff. Oh, for sure. For and, sure. And that January issue is when the sword and sandal stuff really gets rolling. That's really cool. Um, he's going to just fucking crush it. So anyway. So that's Ricardo. Yeah. Mikhail Hanin did my Superman Worlds of War issues. And honestly, he's right there with Ricardo as far as his, his talent and his um and how thoughtful a collaborator he is, too. I mean, when he does it, cool. Usually I see um usually I get a uh, I get thumbnails first, like real rough drawings mm -hmm. so that we can talk about POV and the layouts of the pages and everything. Um, he does not do that, but he and I seem to we, we seem to see the page in such similar ways that I don't even need to see him. Like he come, whenever it comes back it always, it almost always looks just like I imagined. Even when it's different, it's always better than I, than I envisioned. Okay. He also okay. makes, he actually puts the the text in too. Like he makes sure he, he's leaving space for, for the text on the page by actually dropping the text in himself, just like placeholder text to make sure that there's room mm -hmm. for it. Uh, some artists as great as they are don't do that and so then you gotta that's a concern like you have to always pare down your text to when the artist because you don't want to cover anything um, but Mikel leaves space for that which is super thoughtful and he's just a maniac artist he's um he used to be an architect like a successful architect oh wow <laughs> and he just started doing comic books and he's so good that's awesome um one of the first artists i work with is a guy named steve beach steve uh -huh. is just a horror just a genius and I'll throw around that word lightly. I mean, his he has this encyclopedic knowledge of horror movies. I mean, I, I know horror movies, mm -hmm. but but every time I, I want a, a lesson on horror film, uh, Steve's a guy I talk to. He gives me names I never heard of. Some of them are like upsetting stuff I never would have found on my own. Oh wow. <laughs> like like dark web type shit. Like, like you kind of yeah. you don't <laughs> you don't know what's out there unless you're like unless you've really combed through shutter and found all the old stuff. Yeah. Um yeah, he's a he's just a complete genius, and I love working with him. There's a there's a website actually there's a web comic on my site called The Lost Boys of the U Boat Bremen that Steve illustrated, mm -hmm. and uh, it is just unbelievable. And that was his first comic ever. Since then, he's gotten much better. Even he did a spinoff issue of Last God, and he was doing some covers. Like he just did a cover for Arkham City um, with uh, Dan Waters, mm -hmm. and what else? He did some of the back matter in my source book for Last God. And um, he and I are doing putting another thing together now. So yeah, I love Steve. Awesome. I mean, I could give you ten more names, but I'm I'm probably gonna I'll throw Phil Hester in there too. Phil Hester is a super just a class act and an artist artist, and um, just a joy to work with. Yeah, he's a cool dude. He came on uh, I want to say like five or six episodes ago. Oh, nice. And yeah, uh, yeah I love yeah. Phil. We super, discovered super that nice we are, guy. We discovered he's actually from Iowa too. He lives there still, mm -hmm. and we did we discovered that we are distantly related, which is kind of funny. Oh wow, that's 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 a coincidence, huh? Yeah, I know. Uh, so I'll, we'll do a couple more questions, then I'll get you out of here if that's cool with you. Um, sure. Talk to me about Alien. You clearly are a fan of the franchise. Uh, as soon as, from my again, from my my fan perspective, as soon as I cracked open that first issue, I was like, oh, this dude gets it, you know? Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I love those movies. I mean, I love the comics too, but I, I do feel like the at some point the, the comics and the films kind of felt like they're on different paths. Yeah. Um, they just felt like different universes, you know? And I really love those film, those, the, the film version. And I, I wanted this, I wanted the Marvel run to, to feel like it belongs in that universe. Um, so yeah, I mean, when they, when I found out that I was even in the, in the running for this, I was just all in their face i was like you gotta give me this book and i, I gave them everything that i wanted to do with it and there's these things that I, there's still these stories coming that i want to do with alien yeah um that i cannot wait to get to i mean the 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 second arc i'm very proud of how the second arc is shaping up there's characters in it i i care a lot about and i can't mm -hmm. wait to see what's coming but this third arc is going to be a huge a huge deal so I'm, I'm really excited for this next arc too and actually we're about to put together an annual as well Oh wow! It's gonna be really, really fun, and I, I felt like it should uh, it should tie back, start tying back to the films a little more directly. So I'm gonna try to do that in the annual. It's it's an it's such a great book. I always I recommend it to everybody. My brother's a huge Alien fan. Like everybody, most people I know are huge like 
Ridley Scott alien fans, you know? Uh, everything know. else was yeah. great, but that first movie, there's something there's Dude, something so magical about that movie. I'm glad to hear you say that. Everyone that I know <laughs> seems to prefer the second one. And it is, I mean, it is undeniably a 10 out of 10. Oh, yeah. I, I love I love that movie. It's probably is probably the stronger movie if you had to pick one as far as emotional arcs and mm. character like you know motivation and all that stuff like those things that you know making the story about the character not just about the about the plot yeah i mean if you if you go by the numbers that second movie is above reproach mm -hmm. but that first one just blows you away over and over and over again it's like being in a car crash emotionally yeah. over and over oh my god uh, just getting your mind blown constantly in that film I yeah, imagine just I just I try to put myself in the in the mind mindset of seeing it for the first time every time, which is impossible to imagine at this point. I mean, I could recite the whole thing, but yeah, um, but imagine seeing those any of those scenes for the first time. Yeah, you know, just nuts. And being like, I think there's like that. I throw that movie on at like very weird times, like that. Like there's three movies that I throw on a lot: uh, Clockwork Orange, Shining, and Alien. First Alien. Yeah, dude um that, those are great choices yeah thank you but like that alien is like i i kind of do the same thing where it's like all right i want to sit down and i'm gonna really take this in but i also i know i'm gonna miss something that i probably have never seen before what do you got in your hand there this is the original motion picture soundtrack like oh, basically this gorgeous this, cover this, this uh lp of the score yeah, and um, I'll actually put this on and have it on while I'm writing sometimes, just to keep myself in the film mindset when I'm writing and not letting myself get off track. I'll actually listen to the LP score. That's um, awesome. Yeah, I really love that. There's a uh, the comic shop that I found that I mm -hmm. frequent, uh, Third Eye Comics. There's a there's Third Eye Comics and there's Third Eye uh, Hobbies and Games or Games mm -hmm. and something. Uh, both stores are like ten thousand square feet a piece, and they're like practically a writing store. Oh wow! And, um, I don't go into the game shop that much, but when I do, there's they have these this big LP collection in there that you can mm -hmm. buy. And I, when I saw they had Alien in there, I was like, I don't even give a shit what this costs. <laughs> Got to have it. I love I love that score. That's fantastic, man. So, uh, just a real quick question about it. This was your run is the first introduction to like the Alpha Alien, right? Yeah, yeah. So oh, I dude. made up. Yeah. So I was so blown away by that reveal. I think uh, was it like issue five? Where it was like the yeah, like the, the last very, page, the very end of four. Yeah, yeah, I was so blown away by it. Just like, holy shit! Look at this monster. This is amazing. <laughs> oh, cool, right? Yeah, I um. So that was tricky because we, I wanted to. Here's the thing. So that first movie is like perfect. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It, it ramps up to the next film very like the first three movies mm -hmm. ramp up the um, the physicality of the alien really well. The first one you see the xenomorph, and that's just that the big you see the just that one, and then of course the yeah. elvomorphs, and you get the idea of their life cycle. And the second one, you're in the nest, and there's a ton of them, and you see the, the queen. Yeah. Um then the third one, you see the quadruped, which is also really, really cool development because then you see you realize that it changes depending on what the host is, which right, is something, right. something I always played with as a kid. I when I when I was just, you know, doodling alien stuff, I was thinking about different animals might come out of. So when they when they confirmed that in the third movie, and you see the four legged one, mm -hmm. I was just so, so excited about that. So now we're in this place where do we just keep taking that further and further? I mean, that's what the comics did before. That's what Dark Horse stuff did. Like you just you'd see, you know, the rhino or the alligator or the, you know, I don't know. I just I'm I'm hesitant to just keep going bigger and bigger with it. Uh -huh and more out of, out of the box um but you have to do something you can't just show the same thing over and over because now we've seen it right we, right right you can't, you can't replicate that dinner scene from the first movie and right. like have just have a chestburster moment and have that be enough because now we've all seen it we all know what's coming mm -hmm. you've got to you got to you know turn it up just a little bit without jumping the shark um, for sure as much as i would love to show like you know eagle aliens and you know all the all these crazy things you don't want to make it seem silly so um the way i handled it in that first arc was this you know this the first arc is the story of how whale and yutani finally gets their hands on an on an alien right um that's by the end of issue six we see how they got it and um so i started thinking about the alpha like the first alpha meeting the first one that they find mm -hmm. it's like what if it comes from 
it comes from a human, but the, but the generation before that came from like a, this, these big goats, like these beasts of burden that we would, that we would uh, breed for off-world colonies. Okay. And then that gave us the design for the alpha, which is a much more satanic look. I'm like this, this black Philip kind of thing where yeah. <laughs> the, the big horns and the hooves and everything. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's bigger and it has these satanic elements that make it that much scarier. So that the yeah. it still made sense in the context of the the standard warrior xenomorph, but not so different that it's like stupid, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. I think you know, like the for me, the again, just going with that first alien is like this. I always interpret it as this creature is fear incarnate, whatever this is. Exactly. You know, it is fear incarnate. You don't want to mess with it, and I just it. It, it's a winning combination of like, of course, somebody's going to mess with it. And then you get a ridiculous story, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I've, I've said mm-hmm. that exact thing. I've, I, get, I think that's the perfect, I think the xenomorph is the perfect, is, the, is the, the best expression of horror ever seen on film. Absolutely. Absolutely. In my it's like the unknowing, the everything, you know, because it's not earth-based. It's, it's, it's so good. It's so good. All right. Uh, I got two more questions for you and then I'm going to let you go. All right. All right uh philip what is the sandwich of your dreams <laughs> sandwich <laughs> um i don't think about sandwiches all that much but i uh i do enjoy it <laughs> let's see i don't know i do enjoy a good cuban um is that gonna be my answer i get um when you sometimes when you get like a fried chicken sandwich those are pretty those are pretty magical and then plus okay. lately i'm kind of on this i've been on this cutting phase so i'm not eating okay. sandwiches that much and so i'm kind of my fantasy is turning towards fried chicken sandwich. So yeah. Oh yeah. Good fried chicken sandwich is fantastic. All right, man. Where could everybody find you? Um, let's see. I have a, a website, philipkennedyjohnson.com, uh, two L's and Philip. And I'm on Twitter at Philip K. Johnson. I'm at Facebook under my full name and Instagram with my full name with underscores between. Cool, man. Listen, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. It's good to meet you. Yeah, same here, well, man. Same to see here. you again. Excuse me, because we met at the con, apparently. So yeah, no, listen, I appreciate it. Thank you again, man. Uh all right. It was great talking to Philip. That was a great interview. It was a lot of fun. Anytime I get to nerd out about Alien and uh Lord of the Rings, I'm a happy camper. Uh and it's also timely because he had two books out this week. Uh Alien number eight, which is continuing uh the storyline from pretty much after Alien Aliens. And the stuff that is being written in this book is so much fun. It harkens back to those first two flicks, like big time, where you have this monster who is pretty much like fear incarnate. Not so much evil, but it is fear roaming around and hunting people. You know, it is unwavering. Uh, This series has been fantastic. I feel like somebody could take this, throw it on the big screen. Maybe Ridley Scott could do something with it. It has that visual appeal, that fear factor. Not Fear Factory is one of my favorite bands. That Fear Factor, uh, not the show with Joe Rogan either. And it takes you to like this different place. It kind of puts you in that mindset of being hunted by this animal. And also, we had Action Comics uh, 1036 that was out this week. Also by uh, Philip Kennedy Johnson, which was a lot of fun. It continues the Superman War World massive story that will bring Superman into this sort of sword and sandal world where he is a little bit depowered and you're going to see him take on Mongol in his current state. Uh, Now Mongol I've always loved as a Superman villain. I think this is such a fresh take on it and a fresh take on the character. This also leaves uh, Jonathan Kent behind to be the Superman of earth. Uh, Superman is on world world right now, teaming up with the authority, which is like another cool kind of story device because he's got a lot of the authority figures you've got manchester black on the team you have enchantress on the team also and it's it's basically about superman trying to free war world slaves from mongol uh pretty fantastic stuff really excited to see where it goes and like i said like i'm a sucker for gladiator stuff and putting superman in there a lot of fun also, a Hero Quest came out this week, which I'm a huge uh, nerd for. It was an old game from uh, back in the day that Hasbro actually funded. And it's been, I think, I did the pre order last year. It has been over a year. This giant thing shipped. I'm excited to play it this weekend. Uh, if you guys have picked one up, please let me know what your experience is. 
uh, on that as well. Also, check out Regarding the Matter of Oswald's Body Number 1. That's my book of the week this week. Christopher Cantwell does a great job of writing a very, very eye-grabbing, mind-grabbing, soul-stealing, shouldn't say soul-stealing, soul-grabbing issue number one of whatever comic he's writing. Uh, Regarding the Matter of Oswald's Body kind of gives you like, it's it's set in the early 60s. I'm not going to give too much away, but maybe you could figure it out from the title. But uh, it's set in the early 60s. It's kind of like, so far, it's like a little bit of a heist, a little bit of an Ocean's Eleven. There's a team that's getting put together to do a secret mission, and each member of the team is from a different aspect of society. So a lot of fun. I suggest you check that out. Get it on the ground floor on that because it's a number one that came out this week. Also, uh, listen, if you want to find me, you can find me at BTC Rich on Twitter. You can find me on uh, Matt Men Podcast. Uh, at Madman Podcast on Twitter. Check us out over there. And you can find me and my buddy Alex doing a film podcast called Film Class Zeros. It's at Film Zeros on Twitter and Film Class Zeros on iTunes. So please subscribe. Check that out. Subscribe to this show. Uh, BTC Rich X is the YouTube channel. I'm going to have to tweak that a little bit to make it more concise with the show. But you could also find this show in audio form on iTunes at behind the counter 2.0 we have all our interviews up there finally uh big shout out to suncast from gfqnetwork.com for hooking that up uh also big shout out to uh mr gonzo for helping stuff along the way as well and guys i will be back next week with another awesome interview much love and viva la raza (laughs) 